This was the first World War II movie that I ever saw, Saving Private Ryan. I was way below the advised age for this film, but I remember that my dad turned on the DVD player and the opening scene at the cemetery started. I don't really remember what I thought of the film afterwards, but I remember that the opening scene at Omaha Beach made a big impact on me. And I'm sure that anyone who has been to Omaha Beach or thinks about Omaha Beach envisions that opening scene in their head. In Saving Private Ryan, Captain Miller, played by Tom Hanks, and his group of rangers go on a mission to find James Francis Ryan, whose three brothers were listed as killed and missing in action. What I did not know for a while was that the story was loosely based on the story of the four brothers from the Nyland family. Edward Francis Nyland, Preston Thomas Nyland, Robert Joseph Nyland, known as Bob, and Frederick William Nyland, known as Fritz, all from Tonawanda, New York. In this video I team up with Battlefield tour guide Florent Plana. Together we are walking in the footsteps of the Nyland brothers in Normandy to discover their story. This video was made possible with the services of Footsteps Researchers, a company that I work for and that wanted to sponsor this video. Footsteps Researchers is a company that specializes in World War II archive material from the US National Archives. They were able to help us to get the personnel records for the Nyland brothers. Even though a fire at the archives in 1973 destroyed 80% of the army personnel records, the archives have been reconstructing files over the years and have preserved the ones with actual burn damage. Even though the Nyland Brothers personnel records were burned in that fire, there were still several documents in each personnel file. Footsteps researchers also helped us to build a timeline of the service of the Nyland Brothers, with documents such as the morning reports and payrolls. Along with other archive materials such as after action reports, unit journals, unit histories and map overlays, we were able to add more body to that timeline. That is how we were able to reconstruct an overview of the service for the Nyland Brothers for this video and what we do when researching stories for our other videos. If you have a veteran that you want to learn more about, head over to foodstepsresearch.com right now and contact them for more information regarding your specific veteran. Now let's go back to Normandy. So, a lot of people that watched Saving Private Ryan want to see dark green sector because this is the sector of Omaha Beach on the western side of the beach that inspired the movie and this is actually where we are so very often I bring my, my, my groups here on this part of Omaha Beach. Do these people know that the movie was loosely based on the Nylans brother story? So some of them vaguely heard about the story of a few brothers some of them think about the Sullivan brothers but I would say that most of them never heard about the Nyland brothers and actually when we're going to the cemetery very often people are asking, uh, where is the grave of Captain Miller? Where are the graves of the Ryan brothers? So no, I would say that most of them do not know about the Nyland brothers. The Nyland brothers were the sons of Michael and Augusta Nyland. And Michael was a Spanish-American war veteran who served with Theodore Roosevelt. Preston and Robert Nyland were drafted in the service before the United States entered the war in Europe. Soon after, Edward was also drafted in March 1942, while Frederick volunteered at the end of that year. Of all four brothers, Edward Nyland was the first to be listed as a possible casualty. On May 20, 1944, he served as a radio operator and waste gunner on the B-25 Mitchell bomber in the 434th Bomb Squadron, 12th Bomb Group, 20th US Army Air Force. They were on a mission to Burma, but the aircraft was last sighted while making his bomb run over the target. After the bomb run, the aircraft had disappeared and the family would soon receive a letter that their son was missing in action. Two weeks later, it was June 6, 1944, D-Day the day that the Allied invasion of Northwestern Europe began in Normandy, France, with the goal to bring total defeat of Germany. His operation was named Operation Overlord, and its assault phase would land Allied troops in Normandy by air and sea, and would become the largest seaborne invasion in the history of warfare. The other three Nyland brothers would all be part of the invasion. Robert Nyland would drop by parachute with the 82nd Airborne Division, Frederick Nyland would also drop by parachute but with the 101st Airborne Division, and Preston Island would land with the 4th Infantry Division on Utah Beach, all on June 6, 1944. Their cousin, Thomas Island would also be part of the invasion as an officer in the 327th Glider Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division. Before D-Day, Robert, Frederick, Preston and their cousin Thomas all met at a bar in London. They were joined by a friend from their hometown, Warren Skip Muck, who is portrayed in Band of Brothers and some other men of Easy Company of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment. Robert was the only one with combat experience and told them to not be a hero. 
Robert Jane Nyland was a member of D Company, the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 82nd Airborne Division. He was part of the airborne element of Operation Neptune. The mission of the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions was to seize and hold the bridges leading to Utah Beach and secure a bridgehead so that seaborne forces arriving via Utah Beach could proceed inland against a minimum enemy resistance. At H hour at 0151, the first elements of the 505th were dropped above Drop Zone O, directly northwest of St. Mary Glees. They made the most accurate parachute drop of all parachute regiments on D-Day. It was to proceed immediately to capture the city which was an important communication center. D Company of the 505th was part of the 2nd Battalion and the Lieutenant Colonel Vandervoort. That morning he had decided that only one strong platoon was needed as a roadblock north of St. Mary Glees in the hamlet of neuville au -Plain, the original objective of the 2nd Battalion. Instead of sending the whole battalion, he sent one strong platoon of D Company under command of Lieutenant Turnaby Turnbull and was made up of around 44 men, including Sergeant Robert Nyland. So you can see the church right there. This is the church of neuville au -Plain. And uh, Lieutenant Turnbull and a little bit over 40 men, the size of a platoon, uh, set up a defensive position on the right side of National 13 right there, behind those hedgerows. And as well as they put some troops on the left part of National 13, they were actually blocking, actually trying to block any counter-attack coming from the north. The Germans were trying to recapture St. Mary Glees and Lieutenant Turnbull uh, is trying to block them and they're going to suffer several, you know, counter-attack. Uh, and at some point, the Germans are going to flank them. They're going to flank them from the left and right. And uh, Lieutenant Turnbull and his men are going to have to retreat. This is during the retreat that Robert Nyland was killed in action on June 6, 1944. And it seems that he was actually killed in this approximate area, according to different reports and other historians, uh, on that approximate area. And what, what is he trying to do? He was trying to uh, actually volunteer to stay behind and to cover the retreat. And uh, in the process of covering the retreat, he was killed in action by a uh, German uh, fire. Yeah. Right here. Preston T. Nyland was drafted at the end of March in 1941. After becoming an officer, he joined Company C of the 22nd Infantry Regiment of the 4th Infantry Division. With this unit, he would train for the invasion of Normandy. At approximately 10 a.m. on June 6, 1944, he landed with the rest of the 1st Battalion on Utah Beach. They spent the whole day moving across the swamps and spent the night south of Foucarville. On June 7, the regiment continued the attack. Preston T. Nyland's Company C was part of the 1st Battalion, which was tasked with attacking an enemy strongpoint near Kreisbeck, a tiny hamlet west of Utah Beach with a German coastal battery made up of trenches and concrete emplacements. It is said that this battery was the first to spot the Allied fleet on D-Day. We're standing on a dirt road that is leading toward the uh, Kreisbeck battery. So, on the morning of June 7, the 22nd Infantry Regiment, 1st Battalion, uh, attacked this battery because they were in charge of taking this battery. The second battalion attacked the uh, Azaville battery close to here. But in the first battalion we had A, B and C and D company. The attack was led by A and B companies and they were supposed to uh, take the battery but realized they did not have the right weapons to do so. So they prepared C company, which uh, Lieutenant Preston T. Island served in, to take this battery. By the end of the day they were not able to take the battery. They got a counterattack from the Germans on their left flank. And they also realized um, that a battalion of light infantry soldiers was not uh, prepared well enough to attack a place like this, a fortified lo location like this, uh, resulting in many losses, including three officers in C, C Company. One of them was uh, Lieutenant Preston T. Nyland, one of the Nyland brothers. All right, as you can see, the size of this fortification is huge. Just imagine taking that with just rifles and grenades, like the men of the 1st Battalion and Preston Teen Island had to do. It's, it's, it's very hard to take an object like this with those weapons. So I can imagine that they suffered so many casualties. 
But here we are today. Frederick W. Nyland joined the army in November of 1942. We don't know when exactly he joined the 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment, but we do know that by April 1943 he was a corporal and placed on jump status in H Company, 3rd Battalion of the 501st. He would make it to sergeant the next month. Like the rest of the 101st Airborne Division, Frederick's jump in Normandy was going to be his first combat jump. The 3rd Battalion of the 501st was supposed to land at Drop Zone C. The first elements landed at 0125 on June 6, 1944, but the drop was scattered and a few planes hit the correct drop zone. Frederick Nyland was misdropped and it almost took him a week to fight his way back to his unit. On June the 11th, he and his company received orders to move to the east of Carentan and from there assault Hill 30 the next day. So, June the 12th, 1944, the 501st Persian Infantry Regiment was right there on the right side of the Tote River and they were asked to cross this area to attack Hill 30. And the 506 and the 501st were supposed to actually link up in the southern part of the city to protect the southern of the city in case of a counter-attack. So Frederick Nyland was part of H Company 501st and his company was in charge of leading the attack, the assault on this hill. And as you can see right there, this is kind of steep. We have a lot of hedgerows and the Germans entrenched themselves on the top of the hill with a machine gun nest, there were trenches, um, of course mortar position and we even have a 20 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft gun. So it's very very heavily defended and we have one company in charge of uh, leading the assault. As they talk about those hedgerows in the reports and how the company of Frederick Nyland they climbed the hill to go toward the top and they were welcomed with mortar fire, machine gun fire. It's kind of cool to come here and look at the view. Look, we see the bridge right there, where they crossed. And right now, if you're looking at the map, this is exactly where we are. We're walking toward Hill 30. You see? That's pretty cool. So we're now walking uh, in the footsteps of H Company of the 501st Pershing Infantry Regiment on the top of Hill 30. And actually during the battle that took place here, the uh, assault, we have three members of H Company that would be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. Uh, we have Robert Houston, we have Lloyd G. Line, and we have as well Odell Quesada. Uh, so we know that Robert Houston was part of the 60 millimeter mortar team and he lost a large part of his section and he's going to end up alone with his mortar and he neutralized a, a machine gun nest uh, in the citation of Lloyd Line uh, as I mentioned the fact that he actually knocked out uh, the uh, 20 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft position uh, and we have as well of course several other soldiers that will be awarded the bronze star for this assault, for this attack, and Frederick Nyland is one of them. So that's actually the action that took place right here on June the 12th, 1944, uh, where he would be awarded the, the bronze star medal. After heavy fighting, H Company and the rest of 3rd Battalion successfully secured Hill 30. The Germans launched another counterattack in the afternoon, which seriously threatened the regimental positions. By the end of the day, three men of H Company were killed, 20 were wounded and one officer died of his wounds. The day after, the Germans launched another major counterattack on the right flank of the 501st and the left flank of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiments. This battle became known as the Battle of the Bloody Gulch and the 506th suffered heavy casualties, while the 3rd Battalion of the 501st was in reserve. 
During the remainder of the month and in July, the 501st didn't see a lot of action. Before shipping back to England in July, Frederick learned about the death of his brother, Robert Nyland, through Robert's company commander. He then went to see Father Francis Sampson, the chaplain of the 501st. Together they drove around the temporary cemeteries near St. Mary Gleese. At one of the cemeteries, when Father Simpson said, there is no Robert Nyland buried here, but only a presentine Nyland, Frederick learned about the death of his other brother. In the late summer of 1944, Father Sampson came to see Fritz again before they jumped into Holland for Operation Market Garden. He told him that his orders had arrived. The president had ordered him to return to the States as his sole surviving son. But Frederick wanted to stay and fight. Father Sampson told him that he could take it up with General Eisenhower or the president, but he was going home. According to Father Sampson, a day and a half later he was en route back to New York. However, we were not able to confirm this as the morning report showed that Fritz transferred out of the 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment on October 27, 1944, more than a month after the start of Operation Market Garden. Plus, we have a newspaper clipping from December 1944 that says that Fritz returned home after taking part in the invasion of France and Holland. Back in the States, Frederick was placed on military police duty. In the 1950s, he told his two daughters to always remember that it took a presidential congressional order to get him out of Europe. Edward Nyland also came home. His plane crashed in Burma, but he survived and was taken prisoner. After a year, he managed to escape, and after days of wandering in the jungle, he heard Allied troops coming through, and they took him in. By the end of 1945, two of the four brothers were home. Robert and Preston never came home. They were permanently buried, side by side, at the American Military Cemetery in Normandy, France. 